morning, everyone. That was fun. <laughs> so first of all, welcome all of you to this event. Uh, this event has taken uh, a turn for our company, and uh, it's taken a turn, I believe, in a very positive direction. You see, we have an opportunity. We have an opportunity to tackle problems that are facing us in this digital economy in a new and novel way. And that means doing business differently, not only with our clients, but with our partners, with our friends and our families, because this is an opportunity based on disruption. Uh, many of you will see the book today, and I'm going to talk about it in detail right now. Uh, you see, digital singularity means something to us. It, it really is the point where Technology reaches a point of omnipresence, which means it's everywhere, and it completely affects the human experience. And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. But you see, there are two worlds in conflict with digital singularity. And there are individuals that out there that are much more esteemed than me that have a very strong view. Uh, Bill Gates or Elon Musk or the late Stephen Hawking. You see, there is a fear that with this digital singularity will be a unleash of artificial intelligence that will destroy mankind, that could potentially cause a extinction event. I'm taking on a different perspective. You see, in the, in the digital singularity, a case for humanity, we talk about what the opportunities are post this disruption, and that we have an opportunity to reach our true human potential. And I always say that, and I've, I've given this speech now all over the world um, at different, in, di in different uh, pieces and different parts, and I always say that, well, if they're wrong, then we all live and we have a great day and I'm, 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 I'm the one that was right. Uh, but if they're right, we're all dead and it doesn't matter. <laughs> so. Uh, I, I'm going to take I'm going to take the positive perspective on this. Again, digital singularity is that point where technological omnipresence and the human experience converge. You see, for the first time, we won't be slaves to our devices. We won't be slaves to technology. That's what digital singularity promises us. It does not promise us a world of cyborgs or more devices. And we're going to talk a little bit about that and what that means and what that's going to look like in the future. Mankind goes through an age of disruption depending upon the cycle that we're in every 100 to 200 years. And whether it's early man in the Stone Age to the Renaissance, to the Industrial Age, to the Information Age, or now to the Digital Age, we are experiencing this change. And what drives us to the next stage of human evolution? Some technology that destroys it all. And I oftentimes use the example of, of a farmer, right, who for the first time was introduced to tractor. And the hundred people that used to tend that land now are one. And what happened to the 99 jobs that were left behind? Did they have time to get retrained? Maybe not. Maybe they did. Maybe they retired. The industrial age was no different, right? We brought automation. We brought manufacturing, supply chain. Globalization happened. And people lost their jobs. They used to manufacture things by hand. Now a machine does it. The conveyor belt. The information age, which is the age that we have been living in. The information age is the age of technology. Computers, email, right? Cell phones. How many of you remember the movie Working 9 to 5? You've got to be a little bit older to remember that movie. Dolly Parton starred in that movie, and it's a fitting to talk about it because we're here at a studio. And in that movie, this uh, very hardworking young woman uh, was a, a secretary, poorly treated, worked 9 to 5, but after 5, she was free, right? I mean, she had a lot of things on her plate, but she was free. Today, Who's free after 5 p.m.? Are we the slaves of our devices or are they the slaves of us? Today, we come home, we have a quick dinner with our kids. They're running out to go somewhere, 
right? Maybe we say hello to our spouse, maybe we don't, and then we work. Why? Because the India team is still on, because the Europe team is still on. Uh Uh-oh, they're just waking up in Australia. All right, that's the world we live in. We don't live in a nine to five world anymore. We live in a 24 by seven world. And it's because of the technology around us and the lack of automation. We have too much information. A bill comes in, how many of you get, uh, get bills, uh, uh, e-bills, or you pay via some kind of electronic payment, right? All of you, raise your hands. Bill comes in, oh, I better take care of that right now. Oh, but you're sitting down and you're having dinner. No, 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 no just let me get it out of the way. And you, and, you, and you pay a bill. I remember a time when I balanced my checkbook. Nobody balances their checkbook anymore. I remember a simpler time when I picked a, a, a time every two weeks to pay bills. And they didn't have to come, they didn't have to be done at that second. But today, when our employees call us, when our clients call us, when we call them, there is an expectation of instant communication. And that is what I call information hell. (laughs) And I say that because, and I'm going to go back to the previous slide because I do want to talk a little bit about that. What is information hell? Instant and unlimited access to information. Access to people 24 by 7. Continuous communication, device addiction, fake news, social everything, limited automation. And that's what we've lived in. Now imagine if we're able to free ourselves of some of that pain. Get the groceries for me, they're ordered to the house. Pay my bills automatically. Do the things that plague me because of the information overload to take some of that off my back. Is that such a bad thing? Is that so terrible? We fear this automation as destroying us, but why not believe that it's going to free us and return us back to a time where we could contemplate. When was most of the philosophy written in our humanity? 2,000 years ago? Aristotle, Plato, the Bible, the Bhagavad Gita. When did these, when were these scriptures written? 3,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago? Who is contemplating today? Who has time to? So as we talk about these ages, Okay, and the journey to digital singularity. Each one of these ages comes along with some type of disruptive technology. And so whether it's the master-slave type relationship that we have with devices that aren't very smart, like the conveyor belt or the typewriter, we own those devices, or the symbiotic relationship that we have in the information age with the phone or email, which extends our ability to communicate over 10,000 miles, or singularity where we bring in blockchain and IoT and cloud and automation. You see, these tech are all what we call technology prerequisites to disruption. Each one of these technologies aided in a disruption of moving from one age to another. Each age followed despair, the the Great Depression, unemployment, inability to catch up, and that's where we are today. Information hell. (laughs) So the digital age is born and they are defined by the four pillars of digital singularity. Hyperconvergence, digital moments, digital twins, and augmented reality. Now together they form how we will work together with our clients and how they will approach industry. I'm going to dive into it. The rubric that we have been used to, technology towers, this is data center, service desk, finance and accounting, HR, those don't matter anymore. You see, in this new singularity, it's the technology prerequisites that are driving the solution. Cloud, AI, blockchain, sensors. Have all of you familiar with Amazon Go and their new store? You guys familiar with that? Can you believe you just walk into the store like this and you pick up some bread and you walk out and you leave? And the sensor technology there is knowing who you are. The, the, the blockchain technology is making sure the currency transaction is completed. 
The RPA and automation is also uh, making sure that this all happens in a, in a very smooth manner and new bread is ordered. Artificial intelligence knows what you're buying and predicts it so that uh, it can tell you where to go and how to be, okay? So that's the, that's the future. And the technology that we support to get there is, is in this rubric. So let's dive into this a little bit, okay? Start with hyperconvergence, one of the four pillars of digital singularity. I'm going to give a, a public case study. Now, Toyota, as uh, some of you know, is a, uh, one of our longstanding clients. And, you know, we go there and we do technology strategy and outsourcing strategy. We do great work, okay? Uh, but what are they doing, okay? So we think we're all so innovative. Hyperconvergence is the idea of bringing two independent technologies together that were never married together two independent technologies and making something completely new that has a higher purpose. My watch, is that a watch or is that a health monitor? What's its higher purpose? My shoes, they have built-in pedometer. They also sensor now how I'm walking and my gait, is it straight? Will I have a bunion when I'm 65? It can predict that, why? Because it senses how I'm walking and it's predictive. What's the higher purpose? You see, for 10,000 years we've had shoes, but never have they been anything more but shoes. For the first time ever, the technologies that we use every day, glasses, our shoes, even our clothing, has a higher purpose than what it was originally designed for because of hyperconvergence. It's remarkable. And the Toyota e-Palette is a great example of that. You know, these are self-driving cars, right? And one minute, they are a uh, pizza delivery truck. The next minute, they're a Walgreens delivery truck. The next, and, the, and the screens change. You know, the, you look at that, the whole screen changes. And it goes to your house, and it brings the shoes that you bought off Amazon. You, you go and you sit inside, you change your shoes. And if you like it, great. It has a recycling and disposable for your other shoes. If you don't like it, you just leave it behind and go back inside. You see, that's retail of the future, and Toyota knows it. And so whether it's acting at this moment as an Amazon delivery truck or it's acting, acting as your uh, 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 ride share, it doesn't matter. You see, the ownership in this new converged device of a vehicle also doesn't matter. And if you look at millennials and how they feel about it, they expect that the vehicles of the future can do everything that their smartphones can do and more. It's exciting. And these are some of the applications that they're working with. These are our clients. And so when we talk about what we're, what we're doing in technology and we're the most innovative company in the world, which I hear from so many of our partners, look at your own clients and what they're doing. Because they are impacting how customers, their customers, want to use their technology. And we need to catch up. We need to catch up. Let's talk a little bit about digital moments. Another one of our clients, Kroger Foods, okay? And I, I talk about this one because this is a great case study. It's called Kroger Edge. They just launched it. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, how many of you grocery shop? It's okay. I know you're SVP or EVP of something. Everyone's got to go to the grocery store. I go to the grocery store. I go at 10 o'clock at night. My wife says, oh, we forgot to get milk get in the car. It's actually a chance for me to take a, take a call to India, so I don't really complain too much. Because, of course, I'm working 24 by 7, or maybe, maybe to you know, my colleagues in, in Europe. And then I get in the car and I go to the store. And I go to the store, and now in this future, very near future, you can see that's an example, there's a Kroger Edge, right? And now it recognizes me as I've come into, this, into the store. It's communicating with my smart uh, refrigerator, and I'm going to pick up the milk, and it says, hold on a second. You also need these five other items. How many of you have gone home only to find out that you didn't get what you actually needed? <coughs> Happens to me all the time. Hold on, honey, I got a list for you. No, I don't need a list. I'll call you when I get there. What an inefficient way of living. And yet, that's how so many of us do. This Kroger Edge technology is more than just a way to reprice products on the shelf, which is kind of how it started. It is a basic IoT de device that will connect to your smartphone, to your geolocation, 
know how much food you have, what your consumption patterns are, communicate with your, with your uh, uh, home you know, refrigerator, and frankly, if you decide it will even order and deliver the goods for you, you don't even have to go. And that's, that's the future, that's the now. And the technologies that we provide to our clients, they need to be able to support these types of solutions. Augmented reality. Another one of our clients, Sony Corporation, has just filed patents on a new augmented reality contact lens. Any of you wear glasses or contact lenses? So this contact lens is something special. You see, you put it on and it gives you a view of everything beyond what you're currently seeing. So now you're going looking down the street and you see a coffee shop there and it tells you, oh, that's rated only four stars. Oh, that one's rated five stars. Oh, it's time for lunch, let's go eat. Okay, so is that too much information or is that simplifying your life? Well, if you could get off the plane, know you have just about 20 minutes to get a lunch and you know exactly where to go and you get it and it's stacked to your calendar and you're not looking at your calendar all the time because it's directing you, go grab a bite to eat, your meeting's in 20 minutes, and things are happening in an automated way, or better yet, it's already thought through these issues for you, so, so you're pre-planned before you even get on your trip, okay? The augmented reality case study, this is with Toronto Airports, um, another one of our, of our clients, and here we, we, we talk about this because it's really fantastic where they're going, right? The airport of the future, and the airport of the future will be completely predictive, and it will include a full supply chain that supports all the vendors, not just the airlines, but all the supporting vendors from the Starbucks coffee to the McDonald's. So when you enter into the airport, it knows who you are, it sends you to the right line, it orders your food for you because it knows that there's no food on the flight. It's waiting for you at the gate. You see, what, are, what is happening here? That's all automation, that's all artificial intelligence. When I talk about information hell, could that be making your life a little bit easier? Or are you rushing in the Starbucks line trying to get a coffee as you're racing onto the plane in a very haggard manner, missing a flight or whatever you're doing, right? Texting your spouse goodbye. Or does this give you an, a moment to pick up the phone and call your children? It's not bad that we're working 24 by 7. It is bad that it is controlling us. Let's talk a little bit about digital twins. Now I talk a lot about digital twins. You see, it hasn't, when I started talking about it, there really was nothing like this in the market. But now there is. You know, we look at the precursors of what a digital twin is, whether that's Alexa or Google Home or any of these home devices. What are they doing? They're downloading apps designed to do things for you in an automated way. Connect to your bank buy your lunch, okay? But the digital twin is more than that. It's a lockbox. It's a secure lockbox that survives after your death. And it's your virtual twin in the cyber world. It is not a machine. It is carrying out transactions for you. Why do you need to pay your bills? Well, you can say, well, Kevin, I got that all figured out. I'm on auto pay. What happens when auto pay keeps paying even after you have paid off that car? Okay, what the digital twin is, it's continuously working with you, whether it's your finances or it's your relationship management, ensuring that those birthday cards are sent to your friends and family. It's managing security, and when there's a breach, it's changing passwords automatically. How often do you want your passwords changed in your various different email accounts and various different bank accounts? Do you want them changed? How often do you usually change them? Once every six months? Once every year? Never? Never? How about changing them every 30 seconds? Your digital twin can. How about changing them every minute? You see, the digital twin has the ability to offer a different level of support than you are able to manage, and your human mind is limited. It'll help you bridge your social communities, your data, your work-life data, and it'll protect it. It'll be insured. It'll manage your purchasing transactions. No more will I be going at 10 p.m. at night to the grocery store. You see, I'll have time. I'll be able to spend that time with my family. 
Transboundary communities is a vehicle that we'll be using as a basis for this communication. And what are transboundary communities? Well, transboundary communities are sensor-rich communities. Okay? Today we pick up the phone. What is that? That's one sensor, our auditory sensor, our ears. We can hear. That's all we get. But we have five senses. What transboundary communication promises is that we'll have at least three sensors involved, right? We can see, we can hear, we can taste, we can smell. And what will that bring to communication of the future? It will bring an ability to have a much richer relationship. That might potentially even have an impact on travel. It could have an impact on how many meetings you need to take in person. And as the next generation gets used to this type of virtual communication, it will enhance itself. And I say this because, again, what does that give you more time? How many hours do you fly in a plane a year? I do 200,000 miles a year. Okay? How much time is that away from family? Is this technology that is coming going to kill us or save us? I argue a case for humanity. So here we are. The old business value chains. What do we start with? We start with a supplier. I'm going to supply and manufacture what you want. Or am I? If I'm Henry Ford and I've used this example in the past, I'm going to give you one car. It's going to be black. It's going to be called the Model T. And that's all you're going to get. But as time has gone on and as we've moved into this digital economy, everything is customized. Everybody decides what they want. They want a tailored pant. They want a tailored suit. It comes to their house. Right? You groceries, they come to your house. So if you think that you have a B2B business, you don't. Everyone is B2C in this new economy because the individual drives what they want. And the supply chain for that is very different. It's very different, right? It's custom. My clothes are custom. The color of my pencils are custom. I can order them on Amazon. I can have my stuff monogrammed if I want. You see, the digital enterprise needs to be Supporting that, because if they're not able to get services and products specifically as I need them today, I'm going to go somewhere else. So digital singularity is now achieved, but what does that mean? How are we going to live? How is it going to work? Let's talk about that. Well, one, it gives us barrier-free access. In the digital world, we can go anywhere, we can talk to anybody, we get access to any kind of information. Okay? And that's something that's a benefit of the information age. Barrier-free access. Democratized egalitarianism. It's a big word, big phrase. What does that mean? That's your voice. Today, one person on one tweet can start a social movement. Hashtag me too. Or whatever. Right? True or not, real or wrong, it doesn't matter. Everybody has a voice and it's loud. I love this example because it's real. Land, and it's actually not me that, that, that had this issue. It was one of our partners, and I'm not going to say who it is. But Land in Los Angeles on American Airlines. Another hard landing from New York. Get on Twitter. CEO of American Airlines. I am, I'm not going to say who I am because he's here. I am a guy, and I'm an executive platinum. And you know what? That's the five... Time, fifth time I've had a hard landing in LAX from New York. Do something about this pilot. He needs training. All of a sudden it goes viral. Everybody, everybody's, oh yeah, I was on that flight 242. Oh my God, that guy. Next thing you know, you get a call from the CEO, right? And he says, okay, he's on suspension. Because they got to act now. They're on notice that there's a problem. And this consultant now gets a call directly from the CEO of American Airlines. Hey, are you okay? Everything fine? Now, when was that possible? When was it possible in the not too long history of humankind that a woman who lost her son in Iraq could tweet the President of the United States and get a response? When in the past history has our, have our leaders communicated with us directly and individually? You see, democratized egalitarianism breaks down the walls. We used to look up to the CEO of so-and-so or the 
president of whatever. Now, they're just people, right? They're just guys. I can reach out to them and I can trash them on social media. <laughs> Don't do that to me. <laughs> What's the sharing economy? Well, the sharing economy is super awesome, okay? And I'll tell you why, but it's also scary. So I won't use Warner Brothers as an example, but I'll, I'll use an example of maybe any, any, the, any, any sort of uh, uh, movie house or uh, we can use Sony Pictures or Disney, it doesn't matter, okay? Now I, ha I got this example when I was up in Oracle and there was a Oracle world and there was a gentleman there speaking about a very real story where he had taken a script uh, that he'd written uh, to compete for a commercial, okay? And he decided that he wasn't going to do the normal thing, which was to put a crew together and, all, and whatnot. He was going to make it completely virtual. So he, he went out to a sound crew and acting crew and he put the script together and he said, okay, I want everyone to give me back these pieces of what I need. And then he collected it all and he told them all that I'll pay you if we get hired. If we don't get hired, you don't get anything. And by the way, this is something that you're going to hear about uh, from the CEO of Hyperloop Transport today because that's very much how they built that company. And in the sharing economy, he brought all these great people in and they, had, and they showed the video, they showed the movie, it was like a, actually a commercial, and it was brilliant. And the way that it worked was, of course, you compete for the business. So if the commercial concept was good, then you win the business. If the commercial concept was bad, you didn't win it. So everyone was competing. Now the funny thing about that is they won, okay? But how many of the people supporting that creation activity actually worked for Sony Pictures or Warner Brothers? Do we know? They're anonymous. How many of your employees are working against you in the sharing economy? Would you know? That's the fear. There's another company out there which we even use at Avasan. It's called 99designs, right? How many Saatchi and Saatchi marketing people are part of that network of experts that will graft your logo or create a new tagline for you because that's what happens at 99designs. You can go there and for 99 cents and maybe a few bucks, you can get all these people out there crowdsourcing your design ideas, your marketing ideas, your, your logos and your new brochures that you want. And you get it done for a few hundred bucks, that might have been a $10,000, $20,000 engagement with a proper marketing firm. But I get the same person and they're anonymous and no one knows. What does that do and how does that disrupt traditional businesses? And is that fair? And how does that protect my intellectual property? You see, that's what this really boils down to because in this new world, unless the rules are made, there is anarchy and many would like it that way. I grew up in a time, and I'm a lawyer, when what you wrote had to be correct and if it wasn't fact-checked, you got a libel lawsuit on you. How many suits were against the New York Times in the history of that newspaper. Your blogger operating under an anonymous name, you can say whatever you want and there are no repercussions. So things will have to change. It's going to be hard to work in this economy, but I believe that government regulation is coming. We all heard about what's going on with blockchain and the underlying, I'm sorry, Bitcoin and the underlying blockchain. Much of the underlying blockchain has now been identified to be connected with some not so good things. Maybe you don't want to be connected with that. How will life change in 2030? Well, one, individualized demand. I talked about that. We can craft opportunities and products and services that are specific to our needs. There will be digital currencies, but they will not be Bitcoin or any of the other digital currencies that are out there. They will be the US dollar the euro, the pound. Because if you think for a second our governments are going to allow some invasive currency to come in and start allowing for behind the scenes black market transactions to happen, it is not going to happen. It is not going to be happened because they need to tax those transactions. And our currency is already digital today. How many of you use Apple Pay or Google Pay? All right? You never have to pick out Pick up, pick up your, uh, your wallet. Digital infrastructure will be required and many of the service providers here today will be providing this infrastructure and it's going to require a lot more than what we have today. We will have to invest in these technology prerequisites that I mentioned around cloud, blockchain, 3D printing, AI. 
Preparing for change in regulations will be critical, and government regulations will protect us, will protect our, our data. And I'm not a big regulation guy, by the way. I'm a free marketeer. But we're kind of operating in the wild, wild west right now, where anyone can say anything, anyone can do anything, and that will need to roll back. You see, businesses can't operate without certainty, without protection of intellectual property, without protection of individual privacy. Now, I chose 2030 for a reason. The Sustainable Development Goal targets for the United Nations have been set out to eliminate poverty, to focus on eliminating hunger, ensure good health and well-being, gender equality, and many others, clean environment. And the concept is simple. With the technology and opportunity of digital that is coming, we'll have more time. And the automation will help us solve these problems. You see, there's plenty of food for everyone. They're just not able to get it. You see, there's actually plenty of energy as well. We're just not able to harness it. And there are plenty of opportunities. We're just not able to distribute them. So it's coming. And that is my hope, and I hope yours. And like I said, if I'm wrong, well, we'll all be dead and no one will care. But if I'm right, it's good times. So the digital age promises a future where humanity has the opportunity to reach its greatest potential. Thank you, and enjoy the conference.